Okay. Well, we're on episode 35. It's been a week since the last time I recorded anything. And uh, let's get to this. Hit that music, Johnny. I might be tooting my own horn here, but I really think that that is the perfect song to introduce a podcast with. Thank you to 20... I don't even know, 2017, 2016, Connor, for actually going to the band Polaris and asking for the permission to use Hey Sandy as my podcast intro. And thank you to Polaris for saying, and I quote, you can use it until we say no. I, it, it just fills me with positivity, energy, nostalgia, I kind of want to shut the podcast off early and watch Pete and Pete every time I play it, but that's that's another thing. I guess we could do the intro now. You are listening to Online for Maintenance, episode number 35, Inadequate Botteration. This is, of course, the official podcast of MMOFallout.com. I am your host, Connor, and today's episode, as always, is brought to you by our loving patrons, patreon.com slash MMO fallout. And speaking of Patreon, I have no news on the Patreon. I I thought I was going to jump into something, but I really don't have anything to talk about on that front. I I can't even keep up my promise of uh, uploading episodes to the pod of the podcast early for patrons. I'm thinking of ideas and more of my ideas recently are coming up fruitful. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those uh, today, things that I've been doing, things that I am working on. But uh, I I have a few things I want to talk about. It may surprise people that I'm putting out an episode of the podcast a singular week after my last episode. Oh, yes, I'm working on that schedule. I told you I would do it, people. It only took me eight and a half years, but I'm finally doing it. Today's episode, of course, we're going to talk about The Elder Scrolls Online, which is the point of the title. And I got a few other things that I wanted to talk about. But I wanted to first talk about the podcast. Because every now and then, I like to have a commentary where I kind of spitball things that I'm working on on the podcast on other uh, places. And one thing... I've been wanting to do with the podcast is uh, bring people on again, bring on game developers, bring on people in the industry. I I had a long time ago, I used to do interviews on MMO fallout. I used to have a, uh, I I would consider him a co-host Steve, even though he's no longer involved by bot. Even though he's no longer involved in the industry anymore and all the happier for it. But I kind of want to bring on people and talk about video games, talk about game development, talk about things that developers would talk about. It's, It's a very secretive industry, especially if you work in the AAA part. But I have noticed over the last, I don't know, two or three years that game developers have been much more open about going on to podcasts and talking about stuff. And not just talking about stuff, but talking about, like, negative stuff. What went wrong? What happened here? What was, you know, even back in, back years ago, it was hard to get developers to talk about anything, I I can tell you the number of things that I've talked to companies like Jagex about in my interviews where I asked them something about, like, do you have any regrets or did you feel like something could have been done better in an update? 
and they w- their their PR people would not let them answer that question. Um, I even got Jagex. I got them kind of annoyed. I I brought up the story. I might have brought this story up a couple of times, but I I asked them about the relationship with TS Church, who is the guy who wrote the old RuneScape trilogy. And you'd think I brought up a divorced ex who took their kids away. But I I have noticed that developers, and and I kind of want to target indie developers, because they're they're the most open about things like, here's the tricks that I played. And and I I thought about putting that in the podcast. But I want to get people on to talk to. And it's not because I'm lazy and I have trouble filling in uh, half an hour or an hour of space. But I, I kind of want to have those talks. I don't know what the schedule for the podcast is going to be going forward because I kind of have, I have on days and I have off days. And very clearly, considering it's 10 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, by the way, before before anyone questions anything, I'm on vacation from work this week. I do work a typical nine to five job. I'm off of work this week. That's why I'm recording this at 1030 on a Tuesday. But I, I have some ideas for the podcast and I want to I want to do a little bit more with it, including interviews. And that's that's not a hint that I'm already working on things. It's just spitballing here. But uh, that's enough talk about the podcast for now. And now I want to talk about the YouTube channel. Because I think I've hit a good idea with the... uh, I I used to do one-minute reviews. And I've bundled it up this last Saturday. I put out a one-minute demos roundup. And I played a few games. I made a three-minute, about four-minute video out of it. And then over the course of the week, I'm just going to be cutting up little video clips. Uh, Not with my voice on it, but little video clips of the games that I played and putting those up as shorts and putting that into uh, linking it to the main video. And I'm guessing, I'm, I'm assuming that that might help with driving engagement. It gives me a little more content to work with. It allows me to put stuff up on the YouTube a little bit faster. And it, it hopefully will keep my channel in that realm of, uh, YouTube expects you to upload things regularly. And it gives me the ability to upload regularly when I'm working on kind of longer content. Because I, I do, I want to do more game reviews. I want to do more longer videos. And by longer, I mean spending uh, seven to eight minutes on a single subject. You're never going to see me on YouTube with a 45 minute to an hour plus documentary about games. I don't have that attention span. I don't have that ability to flourish my language to make videos that long. But I, I do, I do have ideas for the YouTube channel. I'm working on, I am playing Star Wars Outlaws and I am playing Visions of Mana on my Xbox and my PlayStation, respectively. I want to do videos for those. I want to do a few few other videos and I want to kind of cross media synergize buzzword with my other website. And and I want to want to integrate the YouTube channel in with MMO Fallout more, like I do by putting all my podcasts up on there. So I got some ideas. I got some ideas for the podcast. I got some ideas for the YouTube. Um, and I guess I can talk about what I'm doing with the website this week. And we got a big thing for the website this week, at least in my opinion. And that is the Game Devs of Color Expo, which starts on. Uh, 18th to the 21st. I love the Game Devs of Color Expo. And I love the fact that every year it comes around and it makes me feel better about my readership. Because when I've been covering this for, I don't know, four or five years, 
And when I first started covering it, my fear was, I don't want to presume a lot about my audience. But I was afraid that the covering a thing called the Game Devs of Color Expo would bring unwanted attention from outside of my community. Because my community is great. I love my viewers. I love my readers. I love my listeners. I think that the people who read MMO Fallout, despite the fact that a lot of the stuff that I write is just, it's really just kind of goofy. It's game news. It's very neutral. But I, I never feared that my audience would look at something like Game Devs of Color and have, have a visceral reaction. And they didn't. And my fear, but my fear was always that, that it would draw attention from outside of my community. Because I occasionally do that, and that's when the assholes show up. And my, and it, it didn't happen. I've never had to deal with, to any notable extent, I, I shouldn't say I've never had to deal with, but I've never had a problem. It's never become a big issue when I talk about game devs of color with people being assholes about it. And, and I love GDOC Expo because you go into the chat while the Expo is going on, and it is a, an, an uncommonly positive atmosphere. You don't... And, and it makes the chats for other Expos so much worse by comparison because you go to Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, wh whenever they have a video that comes out where they're showcasing new games... The chat is just full of people shitting on everything. Uh, the demos, this game is boring. This game looks like crap. The developers are, the developers are lazy. The developers are woke. The developers are assholes. These games should be illegal. How is anyone going to play this? Just droning on and on with negativity. But I love the chat for GDOC. Game dev comes on. People are positive. New game is shown. People are positive. And it's not positivity for the sake of positivity either, which would not be a good thing. It's people who are passionate about the industry, who work in the industry, and who kind of revolve around it, showing support for each other. And and I I really I really love writing and covering GDOC every year. And I spend October to August trying to figure out like, how can I do a better job of reporting on it next year? Because it's not a big expo. And I think that's part of the reason I'm letting the, I'm letting the sirens go past. I live right down the road from a fire station so, good lord. I wonder if the microphone picked up any of that. I I'd be surprised if it didn't. But I, I, I want to talk about GDOC. I love going... I wish there was a physical location for GDOC. That is one of the few expos that I would actually go to in person. Even, even if it means the fact that I, I would be uh, breaking a long tradition of not showing anyone my face. I have I have game developers that I've been talking to for over a decade who still don't know what I look like. Most of them don't even know what I sound like. But I'd be willing to go to this one in person. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned this before, only one, maybe one person in the MMO press knows what I look like, and that's Justin from MassivelyOP.com. I had lunch with him once. I still owe him lunch by the way but gdoc it it runs the 19th no the 18th to the 21st i highly recommend getting a ticket 50 bucks 20 dollars if you can't afford it um and they they have a lot of neat stuff going on i, I like the talks 
and you don't have to be woke uh, in order to enjoy the games that they show and the stuff that they have there. And that's that's really all I got. I, I do... I am I am trying to upload more regularly on the website. I realize that I occasionally go five or six days without publishing anything because I'm I'm doing other things. And I did I did just have an article go up on my other website, uh How About Not Flix, where I watched uh, to, I watched Alice on Tubi, which is an interesting movie. I, I probably shouldn't have brought that up. I don't have much to talk about it here. But I'm going to move on to talking about video game news because that's that's really why I'm here. And I wanted to talk about the Elder Scrolls Online, which is the reason for today's a uh, title of inadequate moderation and there's not much of a not much of an update on that but let's let's go over the news elder scrolls online let's start from the top the elder scrolls online community is in a bit of a uh, tiff this weekend as the it turned out that the company has been using some sort of automated moderation and somebody pointed out to me that it's probably not AI, and you got me. Uh, I will admit, calling it AI is probably jumping the gun. Uh, even if the company calls it AI, it's probably not actually a learning model. It's probably just a, a thing that pulls in keywords and kind of parses out uh, punishment from there. But Elder Scrolls Online, people uh, people figured out that Zenimax is using automated moderation. And the most obvious reason that they figured it out was because well, people were getting punished for stuff that they said in DMs. And you could say, well, maybe the person actually reported you, but also people were getting punished for using swear words against bosses in solo instanced arenas, which... I don't think the boss is reporting them, makes it very clear that the game is using some sort of automated uh, automated moderation. Now, the problem here is that people talk shit in games, and it raises a lot of questions about what's the point of a pro profanity filter if you're going to ban people for swearing? Why have a toggleable profanity filter if you're going to ban people for saying fuck you and more importantly do you really want to be the company that's moderating private chat that you are not asked to moderate people saying swear words in private clan chat and nobody has a problem with it and and I get that you want an ex to an extent you don't want the community to get too toxic, but nobody asks for this. At at the end of the day, and where it's really come up is in the role playing community, where people are getting banned, people are getting muted for saying things in role playing, like calling someone an asshole, talking about slavery, which is weird. I'm I'm not going to justify it. The Elder Scrolls Online RP community that look, I'm not going to judge people for how they RP as as dark as some of it gets. The point here is that is it really the games is it really Zenimax's responsibility or job or who asked for them to be policing the role playing community? using a bot to dish out punishment for things that nobody had a problem with in the first place for role playing for people shit talking among friends does it have a place probably not is it good for the community in the long run probably not 
because you're just going to drive people off the game. You're just going to drive people off of chatting in the game that normally nobody would have any problem with. And if people did have a problem with them, the report button is there. And I'm not saying that that Zenimax should only be punishing people based on reports. But you have to have some kind of context between the chat that exists in the public space and the chat that exists in private, among clan members, among friends, even when people are alone. I don't care what you tell a boss in a private instance solo zone. I don't really think players should be getting banned for that. And, and I think a majority of the community would agree with me. And a majority of the community does seem to agree because people aren't taking this well. I haven't seen a lot of positive response to the idea that Zenimax is having this weirdly inadequate bot that has no, no understanding of context, no understanding of community, no understanding. It's looking for words and dishing out mutes based on what it finds. And nobody seems to be happy with it. We are still waiting on a response from Zenimax. I posted on Saturday that a community moderator said that we we might we should expect a response from the developers this week. And it is 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, so I'm not I'm I'm not really impatient for for a Zenimax response. We'll see what they say, and we'll see if they double down or if they admit that maybe they overstepped their boundaries a little bit. And and I think that the best thing to do here would be to just admit that you overstepped the boundary. Tell people we're not going to use this to police private chat. We're not going to use it to police clan chat. We're not going to use it for you know, things things that you say where nobody is around. Or, or even better, I think that the answer should be we're not going to, we're not going to let the system ban people based off of this. Because the biggest problem here is the fact that the system has no ability to read context. So, in my opinion, the 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 most logical thing to do would be to not give the system the power to actually ban people. If it's going to flag text, have it flag text and have it flag it. So a real person can look at it and moderate it. And even better, you can go in and you can teach, uh, teach you, you can tweak the system over time so that these false flags don't happen as much in the future. We all know that that's probably not going to happen because uh, having human moderators requires paying people and game developers really, as with most other companies, really don't like doing things that require them to actually put people on the payroll. We, we talk about it with Valve all the time. Anything Valve can put to automation, Valve will put to automation which is kind of surprising that the company hasn't embraced AI at all. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what Zenimax says. We'll see what their plans are, and we'll see if they actually address the issue. But hopefully that comes out sometime this week. And speaking of addressing the issue, Unity. Let's talk about Unity. Because Unity announced over the weekend... Uh, well, September 12th, they announced late last week that they are canceling the runtime fees. Now, Unity, if you haven't been paying attention to the news, uh, literally one year ago, Unity announced that they would be adding in installation fees on the games with Unity. And the... Response to it has been ridiculously negative. Not just from the consumer base, not just from 
This isn't just a case of the internet got angry at something for a while. Everyone got pissed off. And by that I mean the important people. And by that I mean the game developers. We had a little bit of... Uh, a, a, a number of game developers have quit making games for Unity. We've seen game developers talk about moving their games from Unity to Unreal or... Eh, go that. But it hasn't been a great year for Unity. They shit canned John Riccatello. They have lost some executives. They have lost developers. And it took them a calendar year to announce that, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get rid of the uh, the runtime fees. The runtime fees that I should point out, the company never had any substantive substantive plans for. Because when the when they were announced, it was the, it raised a lot of questions. We had some questions of how is it gonna work? Uh, how do, how is the metric going to work on this? How do you prevent abuse? How do you prevent a developer from say Screwing with the algorithm. How do you prevent someone from downloading and installing thousands of copies of the same game? How do you know that your numbers are accurate? And why would you do this? How does this affect demos? How does it affect charity games? And Unity really didn't have an answer for that. Because they said that the 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 they said that it wouldn't affect charity games or demos and i can see how it wouldn't affect demos but how do you know if a game comes from a charity bundle i don't think that there's any way to really reliably track that unless you already had that tracking in the game in which case how do you enforce it how do you stop a developer from just marking all of their copies as charity bundles and more importantly what kind of auditing system is in place to make sure that unity isn't just assuming shit and pricing developers accordingly now unity stock prices down 50 percent john riccatello got fired they tried to buckle down on the fees without actually getting rid of them. And it took them one whole year to announce that eh, we're canceling it completely. Now, uh, are, are they getting back into the good graces? I don't know. We'll, ha we'll have to see about that. The announcement did come with a reveal that Unity Pro users will have an 8% increase in prices and Unity Enterprise members will have a 25% increase in their costs starting January 2025. And, and I, I really hope that nobody goes back to Unity. All the people who have quit, if, if you're thinking about going back to Unity, don't. I don't know why anyone would go back outside of sheer naive uh, trust because they were clearly doing this under the guy, under the hope that, that the money that they got from the runtime fees would give them the ability to give the middle finger and tell all the people who hated it, screw you. You, you can either enjoy it or you can go somewhere else. And the problem is that a lot of people went somewhere else to the point where, again, Unity's stock plummeted. They're, they're losing executives left and right. And it didn't work. They tried to burn the house down to collect the insurance money, but someone caught them on camera burning the house down. And I think that the worst thing that developers could do would be to go back to Unity after all this time and for some reason 
decide that they're going to to trust them again because it might be another few years until unity does something stupid and greedy like this but you know in your heart that it's just a matter of time it's not a question of if it's a question of when but enough about that i wanted to segue into our next commentary which is i wanted to talk about uh multiverses multiverses season three is out on today and it includes the new powerpuff girls oh boy it, it's really hard to be excited for multiverses these days because every time the game puts out an update it just kind of reminds me of how much the studio at player first games has squandered and how much of that is warner brothers fault and multiverses it's not in a great place the game came the game came back out the peak was 100 53,000 players from two years ago. The peak this time around was 114,000 players on Steam, which is not a bad number. Uh, how many players is Multiverses getting these days on Steam? Uh, it's kind of having a hard time breaking 2,000. I, I think over the last, well, not a hard time breaking 2,000. It, 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 it hasn't broken 4,000 players since August 21st. It has not broken 3,000 players, I think, since, like, actually August 21st. No, August 27th. The numbers are not doing well. And more importantly than that, they're not getting better. And a lot of that comes down to the game's deeply, deeply egregious monetization multiverses is free to play i get that it is also monetized out the ass with expensive characters and and a very large roster i should point out expensive characters expensive costumes fomo all of the trappings of a mobile game that require basically requires you to log in daily the servers are not great. The game is a lot slower than it was in beta. And it's just one of those games that the more problems that show up, the more Player First and Warner Brothers don't really care. They're not addressing problems. They're not doing they're they're not doing anything with player feedback and they're not addressing the issues with the monetization and the monetization is a big problem because people come into multiverses there's a giant roster and you might get ownership of like i think it's two characters and then you either pay money or you have the big long grind toward getting access to more people. And it's, it's very unbalanced. There's all kinds of problems here and there with, with character balancing. There's a lot of problems with the new player onboarding. It takes weeks to get a new character and it takes a long time to get anything in this game unless you pay money. And I get it. It's a free-to-play game. They have to get income from somewhere. But it's, it's, it's a lot bigger of a proposition when you have the competition doing it so much better. It, it works a lot worse in a world where... Marvel Rivals is coming out and they give all the heroes for free. Or you have other games that are that are hero based that are coming out that are free 
where a large part of the roster is accessible. And in the case of multiverses, I think that a lot of people would have just been happier if player first had gone for a, a boxed game by which I mean, sell it for 30 to 40 bucks, include the, include the heroes, do what smite does. Smite has a founder's pack where you can spend, it's like, I think it's like 40 bucks, but you get all of the characters present and future. Whereas multiverses, you have to buy the battle pass or you have to do a horrible grind to get the character once the next season has started. And a few other games do that, and you'll notice a lot of those games are kind of dying. But Multiverses doesn't have the, uh, the goodwill capital to pull this off anymore. Right now there's 880 people playing the game, there's a 24-hour peak of 2,500 people. Again, this is a long drop from the 114,000 people who are playing this on launch. It's, it's a sign of bad player retention. It's a sign that people are probably loading the game up, playing a few matches, getting annoyed and having a bad time and leaving and it's just proof that the game needs an overhaul. And the problem here is that Multiverses already had an overhaul. And in a lot of ways, they made it worse. Yes, they added in the, the single-player void mode, but that's not really... It's not a good mode. And there's all kinds of problems with that as well, about locking content behind... Uh, having access to characters and having access to costumes. I don't know where they go from here because I, I feel like the people at player first really want to make the game better. The problem comes from Warner brothers who seem to just not give a shit. Will it get better? I have my doubts, but who knows? You know, I, I like to keep my optimism high. I like to think that every game deserves a second chance. And I hope that Multiverses gets its second chance. I hope that they overhaul the monetization to make it less shitty, but I'm not holding out hope. But I hope that it happens. I'm not expecting it to happen, but I'm hoping that it happens for the sake of the developer and for the sake of the people who have put in probably a good amount of time and money into it. Because Multiverses is an online game, so when the, when the profit dips into the red, like you know it probably is at this point, that game is going to be gone. Because Warner Bros. sure as hell is not putting out an, an offline patch to make that game playable once the servers go offline. By the way, Warner Brothers, this would be a perfect opportunity to make me look like an amateur and prove me wrong and announce such a patch should the game shut down. I'm just saying, you, you, can, you can own me. Make me look like a damn fool. But that's all I have to say about that. And I have one more topic before I close the podcast down for the day. And it's more of an optimistic one. I want to talk about Wayfinder. Because I love the fact that this game is doing well. I don't know. It's doing better, clearly, than it was before. The folks at Airship Syndicate announced last week that they're doing a collaboration with Critical Role to put out a supporter pack for Wayfinder. And if you haven't been playing Wayfinder in a long time, I recommend playing Wayfinder. And it's not just because I got a copy of the game from the developer. It, it is night and day from Wayfinder when it was in early access and it was an online game to what it is now, which is basically an online-ish cooperative title. I, I liked I liked Wayfinder before the update. I have loved Wayfinder 
since the update. And I think a lot of that, a lot of the positivity from the community, they've brought in so many new people. A lot of the positivity comes from the fact that nobody is sitting around wondering. You don't have that, that second thought before you buy into the game of like, the game doesn't seem to be doing that well. And I don't want to buy it only to have it only to have airship syndicate announce a couple of months from now that they are shutting down. And that's not a problem anymore because even if wayfinder, uh, even if airship syndicate went out of business, wayfinder is now an offline accessible game. They've been putting out a lot of quality of life updates and the game keeps getting better. But it's very obvious that the community feels better about it. People are much more positive. In the few months, the uh, the the population has gone from 30, 35, like 40 people playing it to really big spikes in players. It got down into the few hundreds after after the last update, but uh, it, it was up to 1,600 people concurrent on Steam, and now it's coming back to the PlayStation Store. They keep putting out updates. They, they announce that there's going to be more collaborations in the future, and in the critical role, you can get a new... You can get four new character skins, a mount and saddle, charms, housing items, and sprays for 20 bucks. Now, I don't know much about Critical Role. I've never really watched it. But I like the I, I like the idea that the company is healthy enough that they're putting out updates. They're the the game now has a very positive recent review rating on Steam. Everyone is more positive about it. And and I love that. I love the fact that this game got a second lease of life because I spent a very long time wondering as did many of the other people I know on Massively OP and MMORPG.com, wondering when we would get the news that Wayfinder was shutting down. Because the game wasn't doing well. They, there weren't a lot of people playing it. The developer w underwent layoffs. And it seemed like insolvency was always right around the corner. It felt like we were always just a few days away from getting the news that the game was shutting down and the servers were shutting down and the company was firing everyone that the turnaround while small has been enough to keep the company going. It's, it's been one of the more positive new news pieces of the year and I think that people should check out Wayfinder, even if you wait to buy it on sale. The lowest the price has been has been $17.49, which was about a week ago. So it does go on sale. It, it goes on sale pretty, pretty routinely. But I, I really recommend picking it up if you like a if if you like the idea of a co-op. There's a lot of grind. You're doing a lot of the levels over and over again, but it is fun and it plays better every time they update it. And there's more content. The monetization is completely out the door. The battle pass reward towers are now stuff that you get. Just it's, it's not stuff that you progress just by playing the game. You don't have to buy it. I love it. I, I can't say there's not a lot of negative things that I can say about Wayfinder now. And, and I love the fact that they came back and, and I'm not just saying that to kind of go against the idea that I, I, I occasionally get the get painted as someone who wants to see developers fail mostly by shitty developers. But I, I really do like it when a game comes back and gets its second chance. And I think that uh, people watching this should check out Wayfinder. Even if you wait until it's on sale. 
But on that note, I am going to end the update for today because my house is heating up now that my windows are closed. As a reminder, Online for Maintenance is supported by Patreon, patreon.com slash mofallout. I am making good on my promise to try to get updates and try to get new episodes out on a more regular basis. But you can check me out on mmofallout.com. Check us out. If you're here, you're already on the YouTube page. So keep checking out my videos. I'm working on new stuff. I always have more ideas. But again, patreon.com slash mmofallout. You can join in for a as little as a dollar a month. That's all I ask. But before I completely lose steam, let's hit that outro music. <laughs>